Okay, hello everyone. And again, I'm, I apologize for not having been able to be here with you this morning, but I'm so looking forward to our conversations this afternoon. Um, my name is Stacy Connaughton, and what I thought I would do today is just uh, tell a story, really. Um, this is the story of the Purdue Peace Project, which if truth be told, was something I never, ever, ever thought I would be involved in during my academic career. But if I'm also very honest with myself, I would say that this has been one of the most transformational life moments, um, not only in my academic and scholarly work, but in my relationship to society. So I'm delighted to have this opportunity to, to share it with you. I will say before I begin the narrative that I myself went up for full professor on the scholarship of engagement and am uh, incredibly grateful to Steve Abel, to Shelley Wadsworth, McDerm McDermott Wadsworth, and to many others who have given me input into how to craft that narrative and tell that story. And so if anyone would like a copy of my narrative, um, I'd be more than, more than happy to share it. The guide was instrumental, so a big plug to the guy that, that Steve and Rod put together as well. All right, without further ado, let me, let me share a little story. So in 2011, I had the opportunity to be seated around the table with a gentleman named Mr. Milt Lowenstein. He is a retired business executive, a Purdue alum in chemical engineering, our then uh, associate dean for research, Mohan Dutta, in the College of Liberal Arts, and of course myself. And really, we were conversing about Mr. Lowenstein's vision, which was how to prevent further political violence in the world. Not a small vision, right? But that was what he really wanted to partner with Purdue University um, to try to, to reduce. I uh, myself had not been a political violence expert. I had not ever been to West Africa, which was part of the world that he wanted to focus on. So I oftentimes wondered why in the world was I seated at this table? And as I learned more about what would then become the mission of the Purdue Peace Project, I started to see myself a little bit more in Mr. Lowenstein's vision. That is, he wanted to convene groups of local citizens and leaders in areas where clearly identified situations threatened to lead to political violence and to encourage and assist these citizens in their efforts to bring about peaceful solutions. In promoting what we call locally driven and inclusive approaches to peace building, our goals are twofold. First, we seek to reduce the likelihood of political violence and contribute to lasting peace. And second, we seek to add to the body of knowledge in the peace building field by documenting and disseminating our work to practitioners and scholars alike. Now, moments ago, we talked about where do we put the focus? You notice in this document where the focus is put, right? It's on the issue, on reducing political violence. The body of knowledge that would then come out of this engaged scholarship work was secondary, and it always was during the Purdue Peace Project's time. We began assembling a team, right, of experts um, and practitioners, people who had background in peace building and development, but also people who had worked with local citizens, right, of different, uh, of different varieties all around West Africa. These included Purdue students, both graduate and undergraduate, and over time, that team built, right? Very important to our efforts was not only the team that was kind of the elite, if you will, people who had been in professional places of practice, right, and working in peace building or academics, but everyday citizens in West Africa. So here you see some of those wonderful folks from Bong County in Liberia. Here you see some of them from the Upper West region of Ghana. They became our collaborators, right? people who had the knowledge that we did not have, right, to shed light on how to prevent political violence in their own communities, and absolutely key, key, key collaborators in all of our efforts. We, of course, consider this to be an initiative of engaged scholarship. And again, we were enlightened by the guide, as well as the growing body of work on engaged scholarship that transcends different disciplines. This is an example of the work of, uh, or some of the features that the guide puts out, also reiterated by some of my colleagues in communication. 
right? Very important to the Purdue Peace Project, of course, is a focus on practical and social um, kind of issue here, which is the reduction of political violence. We wanted to make sure that in our relationships, and this is a word that we come back to often, with scholars, practitioners, in this case, our everyday citizens, that we are reflexive and genuinely so, not paying lip service to that important word, right? And that we are also, as much as we can be, equitable, right? And this is a contested term in scholarly and practitioner relationships. Furthermore, as all good engaged scholarship does, we wanted to make sure that knowledge was co-produced, right? Co-construction is something that comes up oftentimes in the work that we do. So where do we land in kind of the body of work that is both academic as well as practitioner-based? Well, this kind of approach, what you saw in the mission statement and what you see um, on the screen, falls within what USAID, what uh, organizations like Peace Direct or Catholic Relief Services or academics like us would call locally led peace building. And so this is kind of the niche that we're seeking to kind of converse in, right? It's an approach in which people involved in and most affected by violent conflict work together to create and enact their own solutions to prevent, reduce, and or transform the conflict with the support that they desire from outsiders. This definition arose from a group, right, of us who gathered um, in, I believe this one was in Boston, Massachusetts. It included Peace Direct, um, a representative cons from Conciliation Resources, some folks from uh, the African continent, from other parts of Europe. We were one of the representatives from the United States. It produced what is called the Locally Driven Peace Building kind of report. It was published in 2015. This definition that we co-constructed together is now what the Bosch Foundation utilizes when they're sending out funding proposals or calls, requests for proposals in this particular area. So here are our local peace builders, right? Some you see in Delta State, Nigeria, Monrovia, Liberia, Barakum, Ghana, right? So all, all different parts of the West African, um, West African region of the world. When I first learned that I would be um, charged with convening and, um, and trying to build this initiative, I was incredibly nervous because this was not my home base, right? I was trained at a research one like many of you were, right? I was trained on a research track. I had no idea really uh, what engaged scholarship entailed or, or the kinds of challenges that one would face when putting together a pro program like this. So I immediately went to kind of what I knew, right, from academia to try to start building out what we wanted, um, and we is, is a very broad collective here, um, in, in this program to be guided by. And so we turned to work, for example, on dialogue, right, which talks about the practice of dialogue and peace building context. We looked at work that, that conceived of dialogue as being inclusive, as potentially transformative, but necessary, te necessarily tensional, right? Meaning that a lot of very deeply seated differences and contestations absolutely must be given the space to allow um, to flourish and, and to speak. Uh, we were inspired by work on leadership as emergent and democratic and definitely communicative. We wanted to celebrate local citizens' agentic potential to exhibit leadership. So not a typical top-down development approach that so often happens in this space, right? But rather one that embraced local knowledges, right? And didn't necessarily see those of us coming in as experts, but rather people who would journey with. We wanted to contribute to knowledge building, but also have a positive impact on the world. And we wanted to contend that peace building was indeed inextricably tied to communication and organizing. Now this kind of um, presentation of, of the work, right, works when you're in a context similar to this one, but it's a little bit different when you're talking to people at the UN or when you're talking to people, shall we say, in remote parts of Ghana. So what we decided to do was put together a little video, right, that showcased the approach and we hope 
in a little bit more enjoyable way <laughs> than maybe what I could do verbally. And here it is. Headlines show violent conflict in all corners of the world. What can be done to prevent this violence? How can people inside conflict zones, working with researchers at Purdue University, make a difference? This is how the Purdue Peace Project promotes lasting peace in West Africa and Central America. Together with local citizens on the ground, we identify conflicts like tensions over natural resources, inter-ethnic disputes, or friction around elections. Each of these poses the dangerous threat of political violence, armed conflict over resources or power. To prevent this, we embrace a locally-led approach to peace building. We believe that people living amidst conflict have the best knowledge to prevent violence. Using a balanced and data-driven approach, our team visits communities multiple times, learns from them about their context, and determines their openness to collaboration. We create space for dialogue that includes all groups affected by a conflict. Out of these intense dialogues comes a range of ideas and a group of leaders who act for peace in their community. We call this group a local peace committee, and we've seen committees do creative work that's making a true difference. For example, reuniting communities in Nigeria after a long-standing dispute over land, bridging intense ethnic and religious divides in Ghana, and being one of the first groups to spread Ebola awareness and violence prevention messages in Liberia. We take the science of monitoring and evaluation seriously, as do our local collaborators. Together, we document our work, systematically measure our impact over time, and share what we've learned. We're the Purdue Peace Project, promoting peace through local action. All right, this one I should say was produced um, by a company in New York, but we have incredible local talent <laughs> here at Purdue. And I'll just put in a plug for the Brian Lamb School of Communication of students who are eager, right, to get experience with videography and other kinds of things um, that we could certainly uh, work with and collaborate on to produce these kinds of things. So with that approach that you saw there, right, over time, uh, local citizens helped resolve a 13-year-long chieftaincy dispute in Ghana, worked with the local government to settle a decades-long land dispute in Nigeria, helped prevent violence between Muslims and Christians in northern Ghana, and led a systematic grassroots effort to combat Ebola in Liberia. What I thought I would do is give you just a couple examples of, of, that, of some of that uh, impact, and then also give you kind of a, just a sense of how we tried to trace that, right? And uh, showcase that impact in different kinds of ways. So this is the first project that the Purdue Peace Project was involved in. It's in the central part of Ghana in a city called Barakum. The conflict there that was leading to violence and, and stymieing development in that region was the, who was the legitimate leader of the community. Right, and so who is the kind of quote unquote legitimate chief? This was um, a, uh, a challenge that had been held up in the traditional judiciary system for several years, right? This local peace committee that came together, you see them in the upper right hand corner, their mission was to try to get that traditional judicial council to speed up its efforts so that they could have a legitimate chief declared in their community. Um, so we entered in and, and helped finance, right, a lot of the efforts that they themselves designed and put into practice. Um, we journeyed with them in different ways, collected data across um, all of that, and I'm happy to go into more detail as we talk about it. But you see the, the output or the outcome um, that is listed there, and that is that after um, a few years, right, their efforts bore fruit in that they were able to get the traditional judicial committee to finally make a decision. Very importantly, this was not a partisan effort in any stretch of the imagination, but rather an effort to get that judicial process to speed along a little bit um, more quickly. Um, on the Purdue side, you'll see that Purdue University News Service put out a press release right? Um, they're wonderful to work with. Uh, you know, anytime we have something to, to talk about, that news release got picked up in different media outlets, right, um, as well. So another way to show impact. 
one of the um, stories that I am, am um, always uh, the most uh, humbled and touched by is what I witnessed our, our colleagues and friends in Liberia do prior to the Ebola crisis and during the Ebola crisis itself. So the second project that we had as, as a team in the Purdue Peace Project was in Liberia. Um, we worked with uh, what are called the pen pen drivers. These are our motorcycle taxiists uh, that oftentimes were child soldiers during Charles Taylor's um, regime in, in Liberia. Uh, these individuals for a long time have felt that they've been um, isolated, right? Marginalized from traditional society, uh, partly because of their background, partly because they are oftentimes paid by political candidates um, to incite violence during elections and, and the like. We entered um, to work with them at a time when tensions were very high between themselves, the government and the police, and that was resulting in different kinds of violent conflict within the capital city of Monrovia. So you see there, we um, embraced different uh, actor groups and spent a lot of time building trust with them, communicating with them, so they would get to know um, us a little bit as well. Um, once they invited us to collaborate with them, which is always very important, right? We wait for an invitation. We don't go in and impose. We gathered together in what we call an actor meeting, and this one took place in July 2013. It involved representatives of all of these different groups that you see here, who later formed that local uh, peace committee that you saw the video talking a little bit about. Um, they identified several strategies that they wanted to employ in order to reduce these tensions between the police um, and their groups and the government. And that multimedia campaign, the organizational strategies, policy making, making and enforcement mechanisms were just starting to take hold, right? So here you see some of the multimedia campaign messages that they had started to place in different key spots in Monrovia, Liberia when suddenly the Ebola outbreak happens, right? And so this is about, um, this would have been taken in about, I think, August 2014, right? We know that the numbers in August 2014, at least the official count of people affected in Liberia by Ebola were about 694 officially, probably many more unofficially, and that by December of 2000, um, that should be 2014, uh, close to 5,000 had, had passed away from the virus. Again, official, official counts. I remember the phone call that I received from the head of the, the local peace committee um, during that time saying, um, Stacy, would it be possible for us to shift our focus from focusing on the tension that we as pen pen writers are having with um, government, et cetera, um, to trying to prevent the further spread of this virus. You know, I know why she was calling me because she knows the politics of donor funded kinds of projects, right? And the donor wanted us to be focused on violence prevention. This was asking for a little bit of a shift. Uh, but without a doubt, um, I said yes, the donor said yes, right? And we shifted to uh, trying to do what we could to contribute to the overall global effort to prevent uh, the spread of Ebola. So they then sought to raise public awareness about the virus, deliver public health messages, and motivate behavioral changes, right? They worked very closely with the Ministry of Health and Social Welfare to do different kinds of trainings of their citizenry, of their fellow uh, Liberians. They used officially sanctioned messages to do that, and they, trans they translated those messages into the various local dialects. Their uh, pre uh, Ebola prevention campaign had a few different components to it. First, there was a mass media communication campaign, interpersonal face-to-face -face communication campaign, which again was their idea. And I, I kept questioning if this was a good idea for them, if they felt safe. But they said, absolutely, the only way they felt that they could reach their fellow Liberians was literally to go door to door, right? And to talk with them and address concerns um, that they might have about different sorts of, of prevention measures. So they did that. And then a series of sanitation sites in, in Monrovia. Again, here you see um, some of the pictures of their active, active efforts. 
In all, they had 25 sanitary stations in about five different communities in Monrovia. They disseminated those awareness messages in English and in eight different local dialects very, via those various channels. They distributed a lot of brochures and, uh, and posted quite a few posters. And then what I loved is that they designed and produced dramas, right, about um, the Ebola crisis and uh, did that in eight different dialects that were broadcasted over radio across the country. On our side, of course, you all remember this time period, we were not able to travel, right, to countries that were affected by Ebola. And so we um, had a very difficult kind of um, ethical decision about whether or not we wanted to continue or ask them to continue participating in data collection. After having that conversation, they assured us that they wanted to, right? They wanted to continue to collect data uh, because they wanted local stories to get out about what the country was facing during the Ebola crisis. So what you see here is just an example of some of the kinds of things that we were doing to try to collect data, to document, right, um, throughout uh, the course of this. By January 2015, um, the local peace committee had visited more than 6,000 houses. They had spoken to more than 28,000 Liberian citizens. In some cases, they were in neighborhoods where they were the only quote unquote NGO or civil society organization that was there uh, disseminating prevention messages. And then they contributed to changes in Liberians' beliefs and behaviors. What I found remarkable is that even during a public health crisis, right, when these 12 or so individuals were losing family members of their own and putting themselves in great, what I would consider to be great physical danger voluntarily, they stayed together. And not only did they stay together, right, but their story got picked up by different international publications. So here you see a couple of them, Bloomsburg, The Guardian, uh, they were picked up by CNN Radio, et cetera. And you notice here, I'm saying they, right, because Purdue University is not mentioned in any of those new co news coverages. <laughs> I remember at the time, our provost at the time saying, uh, Stacy, could, could we get Purdue in there somehow and smiling? And I said, but you know, if we're really following the approach that we say we're following, it's a good thing that Purdue is not mentioned, right? This is meant to be a locally driven effort. The agency is there. They are the ones designing these strategies and executing them, okay? So transformation for us, we were tracking on different kinds of levels, um, individual, group, and societal. And what I think I will do, Rod, in the interest of time is leave us with um, this one video here where you can listen to them talk about the impact in, in their own words. I came to the police for 2006, a call to serve my country. 2005, after the disarmament, young people didn't have anything to do besides a little amount was given to them. So we thought it wise to see how best we could bring some things on board. So a few people went to Guinea and brought a motorbike called Pimpin. So more people venture into that to see how best to ride a motorbike and get their own money. And right now the Pampian Rider have been looking at as bad boys, or bad men, or violent perpetrators. Now they have been stigmatized. So against the backdrop, we look at them, especially as the election is coming too close. We said, no, these guys are key partners that we need to, to totally engage. So we are now in the community through the Pampian Network trying to bridge this gap of stigmatization. So uh, Purdue, through the Pempen Network, they have been helping us a lot, arranging town hall meetings, you know, getting our people there to talk to them. So we all sit together to see how we can resolve it instead of engaging to violence. We were divided, but Purdue Peace Project has brought all together. Through the Boom Pempen Peace Network, we have a cordial relationship, the motorcyclists, with the police now. So this election is very important. So we have to give back to them by proving ourselves that we are able to meet team and hold our own elections. The Purdue Peace Project 
it brought us together in a way that your problem is my problem. We share together. We interact together. We don't want violence like what happened in the past 10 years. Liberia is all we have, and this piece we ourselves have to hold it at Liberia. So we, we're going to work with our people and do everything possible. We all have to get involved. We all have to speak out. We must send a message clear that Liberia is all we have. We all have to work together for a peaceful election in 2017. All right, as I close here, let me just um, share uh, one slide that I think is just really um, a, a beautiful one. I can talk um, later just about some of the different kinds of ways that, um, that we've communicated the impact through websites or social media or other kinds of things. But one of the things that um, our local peace committee members wanted to do um, is all come together right, in a space, and, and they refer to it as a retreat where they could share their experiences, right? So we did one in Ghana, we did one um, in Liberia. These are pictures of the one that we did in Ghana, it was today. For many individuals, this is the first time that they had traveled to this particular city in Ghana, which is Tulbadom. Um, they came together, uh, did what you're seeing here, uh, visited different parts of this very volatile um, place in Ghana that has a lot of uh, very complex different triggers of violence and potential violence. Um, but they created a network within Ghana, they themselves of local peace builders, right? So I think to Shelley's point earlier, you know, you never, at least I have found that we never quite know what is going to happen, right, as we take these journeys on, in this case, engaged scholarship. Um, you know, I would never have imagined at the beginning that, you know, coming out of this would be networks of local peace builders in Liberia or Ghana who really wanted to learn from one another, co-mentor a network. But until um, someone had kind of catalyzed, right, or kind of uh, given impetus, right, to, to encouraging and to making those kinds of opportunities even possible for them, um, uh, you know, that they, they had not yet before had a chance to do that. So that is the story um, of the Purdue Peace Project. And I'm happy if we've got a, a few moments to answer any questions um, that y'all may have.